Stealing is an irrational act. It's like being a professional child, a professional kid, and going out here and, and living your dreams of fantasies. We try to expand and, and build on the edges of the map. We try to bring those stories back because that's what we're about. This area in Queen Maudland, not only is it one of the most remote places to get to, it's one of the most difficult places to get to and one of the most expensive. I mean, the nearest major city to where we're climbing in this, uh, on this trip is about 2,300 miles away. That's a big statement. There is no rescue possibility there. Maybe within a week or two with today's technology, but it is absolutely the definition of utter remoteness. If you're not completely prepared and packed and have everything you need, you'll suffer the consequences big time. Well, and it, was, it was interesting, too, because we had never actually met, right? It seems kind of like, well, that's really not being that prepared. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> we had never met before we went, out to, went to Antarctica. And it was kind of like, all right, who, how are we going to get along? Yeah, it was I, weird. We met for the first time in Cape Town, South Africa, as we were getting ready to fly to Antarctica. It's, it feels sort of like this makeshift situation. You get on this plane, you leave Cape Town, and three hours into the flight, you have to continue on to Antarctica because there's not enough fuel to come back. So if the weather's not good or the, the ice tarmac isn't waiting, you, it's, you're committed once you take off in this plane. It's, it's pretty exciting. Their first stop, a Russian research station, Novolazarevskaya, or Novo in Antarctica, where they'll catch a short flight to the Wolfat Mountains. And then all of a sudden, we're really here. We're at the bottom of the world, and it's this totally alien place. It's like we've landed on the ice planet. I can't wait to get into the mountains. But it looks like we've got a problem. I'm just going to leave it here for a second, right? Because that's a good looking guy, and he's like, but big problem. <laughs> No fly for you. <laughs> Very good idea, but no fly for you. Once we got there, we had a few hours of good weather, and these winds and storm just came back. We don't even know, gosh, are we going to get out into the field at all? I mean, time is moving, and the tone is set for catabatic winds, just hammering the landscape. These are 80, 90, 100 mile an hour winds consistently going on. I don't know how many days we've been here, but we've been here a long time. Um, 5, 5.37 in the morning, waiting for the pilot, Louis, to come and tell us that we're flying. I mean, if we don't fly today, then we've got about, I don't know, potentially another week of waiting here. Yep. Here's Louis, actually. What up, Louis? What up? Well, I think that's our best chance. It looks good. It looks OK. It looks OK. Like, yeah, we'll take, I think, yeah, we should go and check it out for sure. There was a little weather window and we loaded our gear in the plane and just went for it, just took off. And he, two of these planes crashed. Uh, we were out on this expedition at this time. So it was pretty spicy. There's no guarantees at all in any way on these kind of trips out here. But I was actually really excited because I'd flown over the area we were going to about 10 years previous from this trip. And so this was kind of this dream come true. I'd been salivating over these photos I had of these untouched huge walls probably the most remote walls on the planet that you can climb. And so I was about to get back to those and see those again and climb them with new friends and new brothers. And it was, that moment was coming. And we were right there. The wind was just pushing us away from that plane. But Louis, Louis, Louis crawled in. It. Yeah, Louis yeah. crawled in and just fired it up. And it, the funny thing is, too, I remember, like, you think of the wind, and it's a very immediate element. That's what it is. You know, it's, it, it bites your face. It's cold. It chills you, right? But then you look at the power of the wind. And uh, when you land in that environment, the power of the wind is really illustrated. I mean, you see a landscape that is sculpted by the wind. And this, this cornice here that Freddie's walking next to, that's just wind and time. Wind and time and snow. And it's incredible, because when you get dropped off, and I remember getting dropped off, and Mike's like, loving life. <laughs> it's pretty exciting to be dropped off for the next, gosh, almost two months and just be like, wow. It really pulls you into 
the moment of now. And so I talk about the time is now, the time is now, but once you get disconnected and pushed into the wild, remote wilderness like this, you're in the moment of now whether you like it or not, and it's just an incredible feeling. It's, it's emotional. Uh, but I do remember that feeling of being super overwhelmed when we landed because it's you and birds. That's it, right? It's the four of you and birds, and there is no other life down there. It's utter solitude, and immediately we started building our camp because those catabatic winds were coming, and we've, we already knew that for the last two and a half weeks, so we were right to it. Got to work, started building our camp, and in survival mode. And, and, and building the camp, is, it's a, it's a full-day process. You can kind of see us here erecting a wall that would hopefully sort of circle the camp and keep us safe from the catabatics, right? That was, that was the idea. Yet, you'll see here in just a little bit, we got completely worked. By, I, all my experience leading up to this day, that's, that's one of the things I love is the mystery. I thought I had this experience to create this wonderful shelter, yet that mystery will keep surprising you. And immediately when you're in these environments, when you're in Antarctica, the first thing you, that you feel, obviously, is it's a very tactile you know, experience. It, it's very cold. We're living in temperatures colder than your freezer at home the entire time. And if you can imagine that, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're dealing with your hands in these temperatures, right? And one of our ideas was, well, to facilitate travel across the ice cap or across the terrain, we'll, we'll bring down kites and we'll kite ski. So now you've got hundreds of strings at minus 20 with no gloves on, and that does not work. Uh, well, we, it was kind of a nice day. It was about 30 mile an hour winds, feasible with these size of kites. So we started getting the kites out, getting everything ready, and within an hour or two, it was double that, so 60 miles an hour. And putting up a kite of this size in that wind, we were already prepared and ready, so we just decided to go for it. So Mike like pops his kite up and goes from zero to 60 in two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately like dumps the kite and falls, you know, like it was so horrifying. Everybody's like, oh my God. I, I had to pull the emergency to play. I mean, it was instant terror. I mean, it was, we soon found out it, was, it just wasn't gonna work out too well. Yeah. This is Mike in the acceleration process. <laughs> like, oh my God. What's happening? And the next thing I just see is just like powder everywhere. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm not going to do that. I just said, I didn't even say, I don't even think I said anything. I just started packing my kite. I, I, was, I was happy to be your guinea pig. I yeah, was like, totally, completely excited about it, actually. Well, the funny thing is you ditched the kite, right? You ditched the kite, and I'm like, Thank you, Mike, for ditching the kite. I don't think this is going to work. The next thing I see is the kite go flying and Mike doing the first 100-meter dash in Antarctica in ski boots. <laughs> well, and if I didn't cut loose, I would be being dragged across the ice and just boom, boom, I mean, just getting worked. So it's actually quite scary and dangerous to have that kite connected to you. And if you can't cut loose, you'll be dragged for who knows how long. But I did catch the kite, and we put him away. Yeah, we put them away, and we started doing this incredible uh, five-day circumnavigation. And I think, you know, we weren't prepared for this. Yeah, this was actually, I think this was the scariest time on the trip. I mean, we were, on, we were out away from our base camp, so we had only what was in our sleds to survive for the next maybe seven days of possible survival. And the wind's getting worse. We're trying to set up our tents. We found this big boulder that if our tents were ripped and shredded and destroyed, we could at least all huddle together and get behind this rock and survive. It was, it was a really spicy moment, and I remember some emotions flowing big time amongst the team. Keith and I were in a tent together. I remember waking up in the morning, and there were you know, three-foot drifts on either side, and the tent was essentially collapsing on itself. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very uh, uncomfortable night. Yeah, it w I mean, these tents you could set up in five minutes took us about three hours because the wind just kept hammering and biting and kicking and it, it was, yeah, it was a challenge. It was a little bit horrifying. But that's why we're there, to be challenged. And it was, you know, it, it was that challenge that reminded me again of why we're there. You know, as you say we're there to be challenged and we're there to tell the story. And for me, I, I remember taking this photograph, which in a lot of ways is my favorite photograph from the whole trip. It became something to me that spoke to why we were there. There's an incredible amount of energy that comes from National Geographic. And we go and do things like this. We try to expand and, and build on the edges of the map. We try to bring those stories back because 
that's what we're about. That's, that's our heart and soul. That's what we've been doing for 125 years, right? That's, that's it. And I remember taking this photograph and looking at that and thinking, you know, I'm inspired to care about this planet. I'm inspired because look at it. I mean, how special is this moment? How special is it to look out across, a, you know, basically a frozen ice sea and, and just and be with your friends and hear that crunch of their crampons? Well, and that's the, one of the interesting factors. We thought we were going to go on a ski tour, and we're not even really on a ski tour. So it wasn't snow. It was all just deep glass ice that you could see several feet into, this perfectly frozen sea of ice. And we were walking with crampons and boots, so our feet are getting just completely hammered with blisters. I mean, it was another part of the mystery. We thought, oh, easy ski tour, yet turned into just suffering and pain and walking. It was beautiful, but it was also painful. Well, we, we left base camp to try and do a, a circumnavigation of the small range that we're next to. And uh, it's turned into more of just a head down supper fest. The weather's our biggest enemy. Every time we get a break, it blows in again. There's a reason we're the only ones here. The weather can kill you. Yeah, the really beautiful thing for me about just doing the circumnavigation, looking for the route, is it always just takes a week or two to get used to the weather. And then you sort of forget that there's warmth other places in the world. You sort of get involved <laughs> with this environment. I didn't and forget. It, it, I do remember that. <laughs> Freddie and I were sort of giggling in our tent over like, this is rad, dude. We, this is so sweet. And, and I remember they're like, we're just going to go to bed. We're not going to cook anything. We're just, they were just wanted to get warm in their bags. And, and it was huge respect because we're kind of like, you know, where's Corey and Keith? And, and pretty much every time they're not skiing or climbing or shuttling loads or, you know, they're dealing with cameras and video cameras and trying to get them not to fog and cleaning them out. And so it was a huge task. And it was, it was really impressive to see these guys work together and help each other along to capture this journey. We kind of like each other. Yeah. He's OK. It was, it was cool. It was cool to see that. He's all right. He's all right. He's a good guy. You know, I like him. But there were two, basically two different kinds of moments of now on this trip or two different kinds of days. There was either pre-joy or there was joy. So <laughs> in my optimistic state, if you're hating life, if you're just suffering and bummed and pissed, that's just pre-joy. But soon, joy is coming. But the cool thing about that is you always get to use the word joy in the sentence. So it's, it's either pre-joy or joy, one or the other. <laughs> I mean, this looks pretty comfortable for Antarctica. You're in this shelter. You're protected from the wind. It's a weather haven. We left this base camp, went on our tour, came back. And we come back to that. And it's gone. <laughs> we had three tents destroyed. I mean, this it took days to dig this out. Yeah, it took a long, long time. Look at this. This is <laughs> Ferocious catabatic winds have demolished the team's base camp. Corey, Mike, and Freddie will have to dig out their food and gear before they can even think about starting a climb. We started packing up the gear, and we started hauling it towards uh, what would be our objective. Both of these haul bags each weigh about 100 pounds. You know, you've got six ropes. Um, you've got three sleeping bags. You've got all your cooking, all your you know, uh, food, everything. And it all has to come off the wall with you, all your fuel, everything. And it's a, it's a long, hard process to get that moving. And this is what we were going to climb. And that's me down there approaching. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, gives some, it lends some perspective to how big this place is. And this is about a 2,300 foot tower. And it was beautiful. I've never seen a line like it anywhere. And, uh, you know, and you just kind of saddle up and start climbing. You can see. Freddie and Mike over here. And this kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the terrain you're dealing with. You know, it was unbelievably huge. And a lot of this terrain was incredibly hard. Mike and Freddie were doing all of the leading, and they were, you know, encountering very, very difficult rock climbing. They're doing maybe 200 feet a day. 200 feet a day on a 2,300 foot tower. It takes a long time, 12 hours a pitch. 
basically the major crux right away is this rock was like kitty litter. It was really hollow and loose. It was almost like a, a skyscraper of Swiss cheese. It was really, really brittle. I mean, it was scary. Yeah. And, and you know, Freddie and I were leading up this stuff and we're like, we can't fall. We can't take a leader fall. But usually in climbing, it's no problem. You just take a whipper, you take a fall, you're fine. On this route, we were like, we can't fall. It gets basically what's called an X rating. You can't fall. Or you might cut your rope or pull all the gear out, and who knows what's next. It was, I had never climbed on rock like this in my life. It's my birthday, and it's the first pitch of the trip. Have fun, be safe, love life. Yeah. Freddie's writing the story for the magazine, and he's also a fantastic climber. So he and Mike will be climbing the wall together. I'll be taking photos, which means I've got to be everywhere. Below them, above them, to the side, everywhere. The rock is really, really bad. Heads up, rock, rock. Worse than we thought. It's been freezing and thawing, and the winds have been chewing at it for millions of years. Yeah, we're just, uh, you know, thinking about safety because there's a lot of loose stuff up here, and it kind of have to go ninja style, really delicate, really ballet, and just make sure you don't uh, make a mistake. One little tiny mistake, and we could chop a rope or send a big flake down and, and have some some major issues. You see Freddie in this photo, he's in the blue jacket. He's got probably 40 to 60 pounds of metal on him to lead a single 200 foot pitch. I mean, it would take five, eight, 10 hours to go one pitch, if not more. But you know, we spent, uh, we went up on the wall, we spent how long together at this camp? Yeah, almost a week just at, at this camp, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we uh, established a camp about two thirds of the way up the wall, put the portal ledge up there, and then that sleeps too. And then one person, we called it the gimp, uh, the gimp position, and that's the person who had to sleep on the ledge. Yeah. And this was a really interesting, this was the crux pitch, where if I'm to fall here, the gear's gonna pull out. Basically, we'll hold body weight. I'm sort of putting in some gear, kind of pulling on it, and then climbing up. And this is where it gets really interesting. And Freddie is belaying me here, and he's sitting on this horn of rock. So not only will I fall past Freddie if I fall here, but I'm gonna hit a nice big spear and probably be broken. And then we're gonna have to try to get a rescue. So all these things are going through our minds about, we can't fall, We've, we really have to focus. So we were moving a lot slower because of those meticulous moves. No mistake, no mistake. You know, we're really, 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 really far out there, and if anything goes wrong right now, it's, you know, we're <laughs> My rope is hung, and I'm afraid to put too much weight on it because the rock is so sharp. My weight is completely on it right now. But it could cut regardless as you go up. It's very intense. And you can see in this photo, actually, here's, here's Freddie. There's Mike. These guys were leading some of the hardest pitches I've ever seen. Uh, but it also, because the rock was so featured, it would hold snow. And that was the way that we hydrated ourselves when we were on the wall. So we didn't need to take water. We would collect water from these pockets and, uh, and use that and melt it. And after 10 days, we were uh, within 100 feet of the summit. You can see Mike out on the ridge there. This is Freddie following in the middle, and this is me waiting and just being like, oh, God, this is so horrible. This is pre-joy again. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm done with the pre-joy. Joy is coming. Joy, joy is, is coming. coming. When we got to the summit, this is a 360-degree view of the summit. You can actually see uh, Freddie and Mike down there. But what happens, you, you go into this mode of just celebration, and at least for me, that instantly, I would say 20 to 30 minutes of standing at the summit, that celebration leaves, it goes away, and then you realize we're on this summit, but it, the true summit is actually back down at base camp or back home. We're halfway. We've got to get down now, and that becomes very heavy really fast because 
it's really dangerous to go down, maybe more so than going up. Coffee flowing, and uh, we got Stormage on the way. Looks like it uh, could get real today. The tents are the only thing between us and the storm. And the wind just threw Freddy in his tent over a rock wall. It got under the floor, and then it just like that. And yeah, it threw me about six feet. Their small base camp can't withstand the full force of an Antarctic storm. Man, it's getting real deal. It could get into survival mode like that. We weren't really on the verge of life and death at that point, but it was getting close to if the winds got worse and harder, it was going to be full survival mode. It was, it was really spicy. But Mike and I decided that we were going to take some gear out onto the ice cap and um, in this storm because we needed to get everything out there. We needed to get ready to get prepared for the planes to come. This image, you know, I sat down to eat some energy, and within, you know, seconds, the spindrift is sort of covering me and freezing me. But it, I just love this image because it shows really what it was like out there. Within seconds, you could freeze. I mean, it was such a powerful moment. We were out there for a couple hours shuttling loads, and it, it's one of my favorite, favorite moments, and especially capture of that moment. I do remember leaving, and Mike looks at me, and we're skiing some gear out to the plane landing site. He goes, so, dude, there's this 5,000-foot wall up in Baffin Island. And I'm like, really? We're not even on the plane yet. I was like, sounds like a lot of pre-joy to me. Yeah. But, <laughs> and a lot of joy. Because it's pre-joy. It means it's coming. It's before the joy. But one of the ways that I always gauge an expedition is how well do you know someone when you leave? How close did you get? How big you just rip open your chest and get to know each other and it becomes this intimate therapy session with your best friends with your family and you leave you, you just never forget that and it's definitely the the reason to go out with friends and partners on these trips I mean it's it's incredible uh, I think you know it's very special um, to be able to sit here and, and talk about this talk about this with one of my best friends and talk about this with all of you guys and share that experience. And I just want to say thank you guys so much, so much for coming tonight. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks, thanks for being here.